Hello, my name is Alejandro Saucedo, and today we're going to be covering automated machine learning performance benchmarking and evaluation at scale. Uh, a bit about myself, I am Engineering Director at Southern Technologies, uh, Chief Scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, and Governing Council Member at Large uh, at the ACM. We have a lot of topics to cover, so let's dive straight into it. Today, we're going to be diving into the motivations for automated benchmarking. Uh, we're going to be covering some techniques and tools that you will be able to use to perform uh, benchmarking against the deployed model. We're going to talk about then the, the, the ways in which this can be automated, as well as how uh, to automate this with uh, workflow management systems and talk about what those are. And then finally, we're going to be covering a couple of uh, examples, hands-on examples that will show you how you're able to adopt this in your workflows. So let's start with a familiar model, right? And this would be uh, the hello world of machine learning, the CIFAR 10 classifier. What we have here is basically a model that takes uh, an image and is able to predict what class this image is. And from that perspective, in this case, this is the image of a truck and is predicting uh, class number nine, which would be in this case, the image of a truck. Now, from that perspective, what we want to do is we want to um, see it from the productionization perspective, right? So, of course, there's going to be some uh, complex uh, experimentation process that will be carried out by uh, you know, the respective you know, data scientists and the main experts to find what is the best performing type of model. In this case, we would be able to work with an already trained model, which we will be able to fetch with some of the utilities in one of our open source frameworks. So from that perspective, we already have this TensorFlow ResNet32 trained model. What we are able to do is we now are able to ask the question, well, how do we productionize it? And we can actually luckily use a lot of the tools available. In the case of this talk, we're gonna be using uh, this tool called Selden Core. Selden Core is a framework that allows you to productionize your model artifacts or code into a fully fledged microservice that can be scaled in Kubernetes clusters. And as you will see uh, throughout the rest of the talk, uh, the, the microservices that get produced uh, have a REST and gRPC API. It produces metrics, it, 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 it has a stability of logs, but ultimately this is basically what we will be able to leverage to say, okay, I wanna productionize uh, my model. If you're curious uh, on actually delving into the steps required of how to productionize your model, there will be a lot of uh, notebook open source examples that will allow you to do so and try it out. Uh, so yeah, you'll be able to actually dive into as much detail as you want. But for now, we will be able to ask the question of, well, how do we evaluate a model that we have deployed? And basically deploying a model is becoming uh, relatively easier and easier. Uh, with Selden Core, you're able to either just provide your artifact or provide a Python wrapper. You're able to convert that Python wrapper from source to image to an actual image, but then you would be able to actually deploy into a Kubernetes cluster. The way that you would do it with Selden is through this, um, uh, declarative interface where you would be able to say, I want to deploy this model. I want to name it CIFAR 10. I want to use one of the prepackaged model servers. These are optimized containers that you don't have to build yourself. In this case, it's using the TF serving underlying image. Well, you know, there's also the ability to use Triton, uh, you know, scikit-learn, XGBoost prepackaged servers, etc. And ultimately what you need to just put is, the, is, is a bucket containing your model binaries. In this case, we would have already up uploaded our exported TensorFlow uh, binaries into a Google bucket. Once you actually deploy it against the cluster, basically just doing you know, the ap apply of that, of that uh, config file into your Kubernetes cluster, you would be able to see that Selden model being uh, managed and orchestrated by the Selden operator. What that basically means is that now we have a microservice that we can send requests to. So, is that basically it? Are we basically done? Have we finished uh, all of the journey that we needed? Well, unfortunately, um, uh, as we all may have experienced in the past, uh, the, the performance of, of the models that may have been deployed to production could have some different nuan uh, nuances uh, that may cause a, 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 a diverse performance to what may have been seen in the development, right? And in this case, for example, it could be uh, you know, from the more obscure type memory leaks uh, that that you know result in a in a in a sort of like a clogging of 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 memory. It could also be a much higher uh, usage of of cores. 
It could be actually um, different sort of like uh, attributes that we will cover as, as the result of this talk. But what ends up happening is the model stops working or there is a massive um, um, uh, reduction in performance and something breaks, right? And from that perspective, it's, it's uh, the question of, well, what could have been done in order to prevent or to be able to, to, to understand what are the exact required configurations in order to minimize these undesired behaviors. And from that perspective, <clears throat> we do have to first acknowledge that production machine learning uh, systems are hard. And the reason why is because they require and depend on specialized hardware. This could be either very large amounts of memory, this could be specialized processing units like GPUs or TPUs. Uh, this could be all the way from complex dependency graphs, compliance requirements, reproducibility of components. But ultimately, there is basically a complexity layer that is added on top of the already complex challenge of managing production microservices that may not even be related to machine learning. So from that perspective, it is important to ensure that um, it is possible to introduce some best practices that allow us to manage this complexity. Now, there is the extra complexity that we need to kind of like start fleshing out. Well, what does it look like in regards to the, the components that we need to take into consideration? Well, in, in the context of model configuration parameters, you know, we did see our, our, our previous deployed model that consisted just of the actual artifact and the underlying uh, 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 prepackaged server that we wanted to use. But there are other variables to take into consideration uh, in the context of, you know, perhaps a um, machine learning model, uh, machine learning uh, model wrapper that is written in Python. Perhaps you may need to take into consideration the number of G unicorn workers, right? If it's using G unicorn, or the the number of threads that 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 your application is running, the number of 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 uh, cores that you want to allocate, as well as the memory that you want to allocate for your cluster itself to not get clogged. Also, the question of how many replicas do you want to be able to parallelize, uh, to be able to handle the requests in the no load balancer strategy, and from that perspective, you know it is it is of course still semi-standardized microservice Kubernetes uh, co concepts, but it is the added complexity of the requirements of the specialized uh, 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 runtime uh, components that that perhaps may need uh, some further more complex uh, uh, hardware uh, requirements and. You know, from that perspective, it could also be things like you know GPUs, as well as the time required to process each request, because it, it would be unlike uh, perhaps other or other type of microservices, CPU intensive, right? As opposed to I/O intensive. So from that perspective, you need to take into consideration the throughput, the number of requests per second, the time for each request to be processed, and then from there, the number of processes, the number of, of threads. You know, if it's a Python base, if it's you know C++ or lower level, it's just uh, the the, the hardware-based uh, parallelization, uh, as well as many other things. So complex, but how do we manage that? Well, there are some best practices uh, and some motivations of actually adopting some benchmarking uh, approaches, uh, basically being able to perform evaluation of new versus old models, how they're performing against them, assessment of throughput of existing models that are being deployed, assessment of latency, as well as monitoring of it, optimization of resource allocation, if you actually want to mi minimize costs, what is, what is the exact uh, resources that you would want to allocate, optimization of number of threads, workers, to be able to ensure that the internals are working correctly, and evaluation of performance under load or stress, or basically long running models, right? After maybe a week or, 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 or so, there, there could be, um, you know, the aggression performance uh, of, of, the, of the microservices. And there are multiple uh, benchmarking types and, and performance evaluation types that can be done in, in, in the general microservices area. Things like performance testing, a general name, you know, for tests that check how the system behaves and performs, right? Basically, you know, how would it behave if I actually run 100 uh, uh, requests per second? Load testing is you want to actually take it to the limit, see what is the maximum rate of requests that it can actually withhold. Uh, and stress testing, basically like, you know, actually extreme loads. Uh, that you may want to carry out. And we will be able to see how to leverage each of those on the context of machine learning models themselves. The, there is also luckily tools that we can leverage for our use cases. We will be using two specifically for our examples. One is for the gRPC API called GHZ and one for the HTTP API, which is called Vegeta, right? We'll be able to leverage this too and we will see how they allow us to actually perform the benchmarking. So starting with Vegeta, we can see that the actual uh, benchmarking performance 
can be done in a very standardized way. We can say, hey, what well, this is the endpoint of our machine learning model, the REST endpoint, the HTTP endpoint. We want to be able to send a post request with you know, 10 CPUs. We want to actually maximize the throughput. I want to reach like a rate of 120 requests per second. And I want this number of, of workers. And then I want to print a report. Based on that report, we can actually see what are the latencies, the, the, the mean latency, the, the, the percentiles, the total duration, the number of, of uh, you know, the rates that it was uh, withstanding, the throughput, which is basically successful, as opposed to just the, the number of requests that it could withstand at the same time, and then the status codes, right? So with this, you're able to identify what is the actual performance of the model. And similarly, we're able to perform this uh, from the gRPC perspective using GHZ. You can see that the actual uh, 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 parameters are very similar. Uh, it's just that we would actually use the protobus, right? If you're interested about what this looks like, you know, by actually delving into the example, you'll be able to try it yourself, send a single request to the gRPC, to the HTTP endpoint, so you get an intuition. But this is more than anything for you to get an idea of how to leverage the tools as we will now start diving into how to automate these processes. And the reason why we want to do this is because, as you can see, there are multiple things that we can actually uh, uh, tweak, right? We can tweak the total cores allocated, the total memory, uh, uh, require the latency uh, per request that we need to take into consideration, the request per second and the throughput, the number of workers or threads, the number of replicas required, the horizontal port auto scaling requirements, as well as the perhaps um, uh, missed requests that would be um, uh, uh, loss, uh, lost uh, as the actual pods are scaling, if it actually takes time. So from that perspective, we also need to automate as, uh, the, the actual evaluation we don't want to have to run you know, Vegeta or GHZ a hundred times with different parameters in order for us to get some useful results, right? So that's basically now the premise of, okay, we've, we've seen how we, uh, what, are the, what are the attributes that we can evaluate? We have seen what are the, um, uh, what are the specific uh, best practices uh, that, that we can use? What are the techniques and what are the tools, right? So now is basically how do we piece all of this together to automate it? and to also make sure that we can automate it at scale, right? Not just something that I would run on my laptop and wait until it's done, but something that I can actually, um, you know, actually uh, deploy at scale and ensure that this can actually be done in a programmatic way. And from that, we are able to leverage the concept of workflow managers. So this may actually come, uh, um, perhaps more often uh, in, the con in the context of, uh, ETL-based systems, so extract, load, transform uh, data, or in the context of CI/CD systems, where you would have a pipeline that carries out several actions, and you know you 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 perform some sort of output. But basically, we're going to be using the concept of workflow managers. The way that we're going to be using these workflow managers, which will allow us to basically run jobs uh, with multiple steps, multiple reusable steps, and we will actually see what that looks like in in, in practice. We will you know will be Come intuitive if you haven't come across workflow managers, but we're going to be using uh, the Argo workflows uh, workflow manager, which will allow us to have a very simple workflow. The workflow will consist of a first step to actually deploy or configure, uh, if it's already deployed, an already existing Selden Selden model, Selden deployment. Right. So we saw that we were able to to, to productionize our machine learning model by actually converting into a fully fledged microservice. We also saw that we can actually uh, choose the parameters of how we deploy it, right? This can be the number of requ uh, the, the, the memory, the CPUs, the, the threads, the workers, the replicas. So basically this is, this is a step that is able to specify uh, what it looks like, right? What our model looks like. Then once it's actually created and, and, and updated and it's running with all of the configured requirements, uh, we are then able to run the, the, the benchmarking step, right? So this is basically running either the Vegeta stay step or the GH set step, which runs the evaluation, the performance evaluation, the benchmarking with a particular set of parameters, the, the number of CPUs, the number of workers, the rates expected, the, the, the duration, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, we would then not just run it once because otherwise the, the, the benefit that we would get from this would be quite minimal. Instead, what we would want to do is to be able to actually run it across a broad range of values. And if you come from a uh, data science, uh, machine learning background, you may have, uh, you may be able to build an intuition 
through the context through the concept of grid search, right? Basically, when you say I have this bunch of hyperparameter uh, choices and I want to actually run a permutation across all of my hyperparameters to see what the actual output or, or the performance will be if I choose, you know, parameter A to be one, two, three, five, 10, 100, and then parameter B being 20, 40, 60. So it would basically, basically run a, a permutation or a combination, I guess more specifically, a, a combination of uh, all of these different uh, uh, values across. So basically uh, that, that is the, the ultimate uh, 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 objective of this. So what Argo really looks like, this is actually first just an example to get you into the syntax of Argo workflows. So Argo basically allows you to perform steps, right? In a modular way, same in Kubernetes. So what that means is that you are able to define in, in this case, what they call a template. So uh, a referenceable state, so a, a referenceable step which in this case, it just actually uh, prints uh, a message, right? So it basically says this, this template called uh, whale say uh, prints a message that comes in as a parameter uh, of the main message, right? So then the actual workflow consists of two steps. The first step is to run that template with the actual parameter hello to A. Uh, and then basically the second one is to run another uh, step with the, well, what seems to be the same parameter, which actually should be different. But ultimately what this would do is actually run two steps with two different jobs, Kubernetes containers that run until completion, it waits until it's successful, and then it runs the next one. That's basically what this is. If you come across Argo workflows, maybe this is a little bit painful because it's you know going from the basics, but if you haven't, this should give you a, a good intuition of, of why we are using this, right? It, it runs a, a step, it assesses whether it's successful and then it runs a next step. And it's also able to pass parameters, right? Now, what we are gonna be able to do in our case is we're going to be able to actually build a reusable Argo workflow. And from this perspective, we will talk about first the Argo workflow and then the reusable part. First, the Argo workflow part is basically the step where you would be able to say, okay, I want to run this three steps that we talked about. The create or modify Selden resource, right? The one that actually deploys it, configures it. The wait for Selden resource, right? The one where actually like, you know, waits until it's actually running because of course you're deploying a model. So you're waiting until the actual microservice is, is fully running and then running the benchmark. Now, specifically in each of these steps, what we would want to do is not just to run the steps because in this case, what we can see is that the steps would be either running uh, Vegeta or either or, or running G GH set. And you will see why we want to do this. Um, we want to either run Vegeta or GH set, but the parameters, you know, I, I, I didn't put all, all the parameters here because it's a pretty long file. But what you would actually see here is um, the number of CPUs, the rate, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that there is kind of like a mapping uh, of the parameters that are used for Vegeta to the parameters that are used in GH set, right? So we want to make sure that we can actually reuse the same sort of type of parameters. And then in Argo workflows, fortunately, they also provide a way to perform what is a grid search. So you're also able to actually call the, the steps, you're, you're able to call the steps uh, by using a, a, a set of grid options and requesting to pass a basically combination of each of those. So you, you're basically saying, hey, I, I, I want to then run this Argo workflow I want to use these this, um, um, parameters, right? I want to pass for uh, the number of CPUs 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 5. And then for RAM, I want to put like, you know, 200 megs, 500 megs, one gigabyte, two gigabytes. And then I want to basically run a combination of all of those things. Same with the duration. I want to run it for 10 seconds, two hours, five hours, whatever. And the benefit of this, we, we've covered the workflow aspect. Now we can cover the reusability aspect. So I, I mentioned that we're creating a, a reusable Argo workflow. We can actually leverage uh, the Helm uh, templating um, CNCF tool uh, to create our own sort of like reusable component that will allow us to actually provide the, 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 the values that we want to reuse. And in this case, you know, we just use one value, uh, which is, you know, number of replicas, server workers. So it basically just would run these ones. Um, across all of these different options. 
Now, from that same perspective, and we can pass basically the data, which in this case, it's, it's just showing some dummy data to actually make sure that it fits within, within the screen. But what this basically would do is we would be able to just run this. It would deploy on the Kubernetes cluster. It would actually run, in this case, only once for a duration of 30 seconds. And then we would be able to retrieve the output with the Argo logs. So it would, as you saw, it would actually print the output in this case with Vegeta report JSON, in this case with, with JSON uh, query uh, that you know, we would be able to retrieve. And you will see why we're doing that when we analyze the results. But here, uh, the key thing to, 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 to see is that we now are able to leverage a component that is possible to save us a lot of time. Instead of actually us having to run, of course, for starters, our model locally with a benchmarking, and instead of also, also us deploying a model and running, for example, Vegeta or GHZ locally against that and waiting 30 minutes and then maybe coming back and realizing that your you know, computer had to restart or something for some weird reason, um, you know, instead of doing that, we're, we're not only deploying this and, and allowing that to actually be fulfilled remotely in the cluster, but we're also able to perform some sort of more complex grid search across the values for the benchmarking to be able to understand what are potentially the optimal configurations for that model that is being deployed in an automated manner. And this is important because, you know, in the context of Seldom Core, the, 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 the core principle that we build against is the context of thousands of models. And, you know, in that case, you have the distributed systems concept of pet versus cattle, right? You can't have every single model being, um, you know, looked after, with, with a particular set of like best practices and uh, a, 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 a data scientist that is like always kind of like, you know, doing maintenance across it. Because if you have a thousand models, those complexities need to be managed at scale and there needs to be a standardized um, uh, set of interfaces and best practices that can be leveraged in order for you to be able to take into advantage, you know, things like this, like performance evaluation. So you may want to actually even start automating as we have been doing in terms of like internal research at Selvin Core exploring ways in how we can automate these components using the cloud native best practices. And of course, more specifically, best practices of microservice, microservices that can be brought in and adopted for the machine learning operation space. So you can see the value of some of these things here. Now, the reason why I was mentioning the printing of the output is because now we're able to actually fetch that output, the JSON output that comes uh, from what has been printed and be able to actually see the results. We can actually see the grid search over here, you know, the, the, the number of replicas, server workers, threads, uh, CPUs, max workers, uh, and then the, uh, the actual results, the mean uh, uh, percentiles, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the rate, throughput of every single sort of output. And you can see that now we can do very interesting analysis from this perspective. We can actually evaluate the results using, uh, uh, you know, in this case, uh, uh, the Pandas data frame, we can actually see only the REST requests and sort them by the rate. And we can actually see what are the configurations that allow us to achieve the, 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 the biggest rate, or not the biggest rate, the highest rate. Um, in this case, we can see that, you know, with, with of course, three replicas, uh, you know, but here we can actually see other interesting things. You can actually see uh, the relationship between, in the context of uh, Python-based servers, uh, threads versus workers, as well as, uh, the CPUs and, and, and the replicas. And you can actually try to see some, some, um, some trends in your, your specific models. Uh, unfortunately, every model may have, not every model, but, but there will be potential vast variation, vast variation between model to model when it comes to the, the parameters that would make it perform better. And this is why it's, it's so important to have tools like this in your, in your, in your toolbox to be able to leverage uh, and use those best practices. So, if you're curious, you can actually try all of the things that we covered here end-to-end uh, -end, uh, on a Jupyter Notebook. All of these things are open source, um, which, is, which is great. And you can actually find it on the main repo, which is github.com slash seldom.io seldom core, right? And here, the documentation has examples, not just about this benchmarking automation with Argo workflows. We can also find a you know, vast amount of different resources that will allow you to delve into you know, from the very basic deployment of models to the more advanced, uh, you know, integration with with uh, other type of batch systems or, or, or you know, integration with streaming uh, using Kafka, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, explainability, outlier detection. I mean, 
you name it, you'll find it there. So, so definitely recommend you to do that. And with that, today we've covered a broad range of different, very interesting concepts. We've delved into the motivations uh, for this topic of uh, automated benchmarking and performance evaluation. Uh, we've performed uh, some deployment of our simple model, as well as an initial benchmark from our you know, local computer. Uh, then we talked about how we're able to uh, not just automate, but also uh, scale uh, this capability using workflow managers, as well as covering an example using a reusable uh, workflow to be able to perform evaluation across a grid search of parameters to identify the, the, the optimal configuration of, of particular models. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining my talk. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please do feel free uh, to reach out uh, either throughout the conference or afterwards. So yeah, thank you very much and see you around.